Okay, well, thank you very much for getting up so early and uh, uh, hearing this session. Um, so I haven't really thought much about failure except in the context of Chardon's work, but um, it's an interesting topic, and here's some thoughts I have on it. So I think fundamentally failure is information, and the challenge is figuring out what a given failure means as well as what to do about it. Okay, so some example of successful failures. Sounds like a contradiction, but people here obviously know it isn't. So Alexander Fleming's ruined bacterial colony, famous story, and the lesson from it is that failing at one goal often suggests a different, more important one. Harry Truman's bankrupt haberdashery, for those of us of a certain age, this is a familiar story, but for those of you who are younger, Harry Truman had a hat store in Missouri. He went bankrupt. The store was a complete mess. He decided that maybe he wasn't, uh, this wasn't the best use of his abilities. He went into politics and became president, and a rather good one. So the lesson from this is that failure often tells us to stop wasting our time on activities that we're not good at, or at least not as good as we might be at something else. And finally, a story uh, that very few of you probably know, if any, John Garcia. So John Garcia was a professor of mine in graduate school. And he was a short, unimpressive looking son of migrant workers. And he came up with this ext extremely important finding, something that really revolutionized the field, that at the time associationism was the dominant creed. And people thought that invariably something that was contiguous in time and space would dominate anything that was further away as a cue of, as to what to do. But Garcia had grown up in the West and he had observed wild animals like coyotes and he knew this wasn't true, that the coyotes would see when food made them sick, even if they had eaten it half an hour, an hour, or two hours earlier, they knew that getting sick meant it was something to do with the food. And so he set up experiments showing this, where he would give the uh, animal an injection at, that would make it sick at a uh, predictable time course, and the animal would get sick later, and rather than, and it, he would also have the animal eat some uh, uh, meat that was no different than what it usually ate. And the coyotes drew the lesson not that the stimuli in their immediate environment was key, but rather that the stimuli that they had eaten was key. Actually, neither was key. It was the injection, but they didn't know that. And Bill Estes, who was one of the real giants of the field of psychology, was editor of the probably the most prominent journal at the time. And he read this paper, and he rejected it. And he just said, I don't believe it. And Garcia, rather than giving up in the sense of this failure, said, I'll show the bastards. And he produced demonstration after demonstration with more and more elegant controls that he was right. And eventually, to his credit, Estes, when he stepped down as editor of this journal, wrote his only regret was not having credited Garcia's work, and that Garcia was right and he was wrong, some of the sweetest words in the English language. So what are the implications of these examples? Well, one is that no single reaction to failure is consistently right. And second one is that wisdom lies in recognizing when the failures mean pursue a specific alternative goal, as in the case of Fleming, when it means show the bastards, as in the case of Garcia, and when it means do something else, as in the case of Truman. So thinking about failure as information leads us to question, well, what should you do when you fail? And there are at least six reasonable things, depending on the situation. You can abandon the goal, just decide this isn't going to work. You can delay pursuit of the goal. You can say, well, it's something to do later, but I'm not quite where I want to be, 
and maybe I'll have some ideas that'll make this work later. You can reduce the intensity of the pursuit of a goal, so maybe you change the distribution of your energies to spend more time on what the, uh, some other goal and only do this a little bit to see if you can understand how to succeed. You can increase the intensity of the pursuit of the goal, think harder about it, do more. You can pursue the same goal in a different way, or you can pursue a different goal. And all of these are perfectly reasonable responses to failure. So how do you decide among these? Well, one of them is the importance of the goal. And this is subjective, and people differ. One person's perseverance is another's quixotic quest. So you have to decide how crucial it is that you attain this particular goal. Another is the opportunity cost. Pursuing one goal usually means not pursuing others. And you have to decide what else could I do and which is better given this new information that I've had this failure. And finally, the sources of failures vary a lot. It's crucial for people to reflect, and I think we should teach children much more to do this, to think about why they failed and to go from there to say, what can I do about it? Another is some sources can be addressed and others can't, and you have to decide which of these two is this situation. And social feedback is valuable in its place, and I'm going to talk more about that theme because I think sometimes we overweigh what the social world tells us. So another consequence of viewing failure as information is that failure is relative. So few activities that you do yield nothing. And the question to ask after both successes and failure is whether the game is worth the candle. So is it really worthwhile spending my time, given this new information that this in, didn't work out or isn't working out, which of these various reactions to failure should I do? Many activities, and here I'm thinking especially about research, but I think it's true in many other areas also, have a natural life course. And diminishing successes are a leading indicator of failure. So what I mean by a natural life course, so you do a research program, and at least in my experience, usually you discover something interesting, you recognize, though there's no reason for the rest of the world to do so, that there are a bunch of interesting ways to expand it, to show its generality, to uh, understand it better. But oh, as you do more of that, you get studies that are, they, they often get published. That's why I say other people's reactions to our work are a la la lagging indicator, because they, people don't recognize when the contribution is diminishing. People are slow to pick up new important contributions, and they're also late to recognize that this contribution has played itself out. And so the a consequence of this is that you need to always be looking for new ways to succeed, even when you're not failing in conventional ways. The articles are getting published, you're getting grants, your uh, people give you compliments and invitations, everything is good, but you know how things are really going, and you know that the amount of gain from the new activity is not as great as from the earlier ones. And so then it pays to cast a wider net. So, some lessons from my own failures reflecting on them. First of all, it's important to fail a lot. If you're not failing often, you're not setting your sights high enough. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> a second is don't be reluctant to admit failures. You have to be honest with yourself. There are always a lot of worthwhile options, including ones that you don't know until you really start thinking about, hmm, this isn't working as well as it should. I need to start thinking about what my alternatives are. The third is this recognition of the natural life course of research thrusts. And as things are playing out, it's a good idea to diversify your portfolio, to start looking at things that are different than you've looked at before, but that you suspect might be interesting, might be something you can make a contribution, and that it's worthwhile trying out to see if there's gold there. 
and also to be op always open to pursuing unexpected discoveries, even if it means deviating from plan. I don't know what other people's experience are, but my experience is that most of the really interesting things I've found out were not things I intended to find out. They were things I found out on the way to a different goal. But you have to be willing to say, this is what's important, and I'm going to focus on this, even if the granting agency may not be so happy about it. <clears throat> and finally, maybe a non-intuitive implication of this way of thinking about failure has to do with failures in school being treated differently than other failures. So school is a very peculiar institution, and because it's so familiar to all of us, we don't think much about its peculiarity. But again, viewing failure as information leads to a somewhat different way of thinking about schooling. So in school, but not elsewhere, certain goals are assumed to be so important that society is justified in making their pursuit obligatory, regardless of the individual's interests, capabilities, successes, and failures. So in school, unlike elsewhere, you may be just rotten at a subject. You may be failing it. And rather than being able to say, OK, deploy your energies elsewhere, think about alternative goals, all the different normal approaches to failure, we say, you got to learn that subject. If you don't learn geometry, you are not going to pass high school. You are not going to go to college. And we feel justified in doing this, I think, not because we've really thought it through and say, is it crucial that every student know geometry? But because it's the way we've always done it. And I think if we, so we apply this kind of analysis to the whole curriculum, we might wind up giving parents and students a lot more choice, a lot more flexibility in responding to the information contained in their failures. So this view forecloses the usual option of using failure as information that justifies abandoning, delaying, or reducing the pursuit of specific goals. You will pass geometry. And the question I think we need to ask ourselves, not only as people interested in education, but as citizens, is this kind of foreclosure justified? Do we all need to learn to wrestle? I don't know what they do today in gym, but when I went to school, we spent six weeks having to wrestle. It was not my thing. I don't think it was the thing of hardly anyone in the class. But I had to do it for six weeks. And my partner and I reached an agreement that one time he'd win and one time I'd win, and we <laughs> wouldn't get too sweaty doing it. But it, it, it was not a good experience. It didn't teach me anything except a little bit about the need to game the system. And there are many things like this. It's not just wrestling, drawing, singing, solving geometry problems. When you start thinking about the curriculum and asking yourself, how crucial is it that every person learn this? So maybe someone doesn't like geometry and isn't good at it. Maybe they do better at statistics. I actually don't know why we insist on geometry rather than statistics, given the much more pervasive use of statistics in everyday life as well as in uh, academic disciplines. Uh, why not allow high school students and their parents to treat failure as information the way we do as adults? Thank you. <laughs>